Hello, I'm Stuart Wildman, Chair of the History of Nursing Forum of the Royal College of Nursing. Welcome to our annual lecture, offered in partnership with the RCN's Library and Archive Service. I suppose one good thing that's come out of this awful pandemic is that we now offer our activities online. And as such, this lecture is administered from the UK, our speaker is in Canada, and our audience is worldwide. I'm really pleased to be able to introduce our speaker. Erin Spinney is a sessional lecturer at the University of Lethbridge and her research interests include nursing, medicine, labour and the environment in the long 18th century Atlantic world. Erin is, well, is well known in history of nursing circles this side of the Atlantic, so it's my great pleasure to hand over to Erin to give our 2021 lecture. Thank you very much, Stuart, for that lovely introduction. I will share my screen. And I would like to begin today by acknowledging that I am speaking to you from the unceded territory of the Chilquequam, Chilquotin, and Southern Dakal people in the interior of British Columbia, Canada. So my talk is entitled Black Nurses in Slave Labor and the Royal Navy from 1790 to 1820. And if you wanna follow me on Twitter, uh, I'm at Erin Spinney on Twitter. And this image here is of Hasler Hospital in Portsmouth, um, which was uh, done in 1799. And Hasler and Plymouth is really where I began my nursing history research before I expanded to look at the wider uh, British Atlantic world. So the outline for our talk today, I'm gonna to begin with an overview of naval nursing in the late 18th and early 19th century. And then I'm going to discuss how fear of hot climates led to a reliance on black labor in the greater Caribbean. And I'm going to end with a pretty detailed case study of the Bermuda Naval Hospital so I can show you um, the enslaved women who worked at that naval institution from 1816 until 1824. Can everyone hear me? I feel like I should uh, make certain. All right. Yes, we can hear you then. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, so as uh, you can see from the outline, my work predates Nightingale nursing reforms in the mid 19th century. The Nightingale nurse was envisioned as a trained, disciplined and chaste young woman from the middle class and symbolized a new face to 19th century nursing by the 1880s. She offered a sharp contrast to the drunken, irresponsible old woman associated with pre-Nightingale nursing. Characterizations of the old nurses are often synonymous with the figure of Sari Gamp in Charles Dickens' novel, Martin Chiswick. And you can see here, this is actually from the RCN archive. This is a supplement to the nursing record from 1888, where we have the old nurse pictured here uh, with the cap and the uh, cross, which is made out of a alcohol bottle and an umbrella. And then the, on the right, we have the new Nightingale nurse, a chaste young religious woman. So uh, Gamp, an overweight drunkard with an androgynous appearance and what Carol Helmstetter has characterized as quote, a total lack of what we now call professional ethics has been used by many generations of nursing historians to illustrate the evolution of 19th century nursing. However, naval hospitals at Plymouth and Hasler offer an opportunity to study a large, heavily regulated workforce of women in the late 18th and early 19th century and help to dispel this drunken image of ineptitude. Interpreting, sorry, interpreting the operation of naval hospitals as an extension of the household management practices helps to bring to the fore the lived experiences of nurses. Treating hospitals as households writ large explains how these institutions responded to naval needs and highlights the complexities of running a late 18th century naval hospital. Labor organization within 18th century hospitals purposefully mirrored that of larger English households. The hospital governor assumed the role of the patriarch or the master, the matron, that of the housekeeper or the mistress, and the nurses were domestic servants. Clinical naval hospitals were mega households where multiple factors, including patient numbers, external pressures, and nursing ability 
and experience interacted and influenced who was and who was not suitable for the important work of caring for the sailors of the British state. At times of high patient numbers, less desirable nursing candidates would be kept on only if they could continue to provide care, while in times of peace or lower patient numbers meant higher nursing standards and a very low turnover in the nursing workforce. So this household uh, framework was explicitly used by medical practitioners, hospital administrators, and the Sick and Herp Board, which managed these institutions to describe the naval hospitals. James Johnson, who was the head of the physician and counsel at Hasler, wrote to the Sick and Herp Board in 1794 and described that he was, quote, well aware that there are many defects in the hospital and some must ever remain, for in such an immense fabric with 300 servants, and now near 1500 patients, perfection in all its parts cannot be looked for. And this is a detail uh, from the plans of Hazlar Hospital. And I just wanna highlight here, um, the D is where nurse cabins would be stationed uh, in the wards. And so these are very long uh, wards in Hazlar and they're um, really quite familiar with the Nightingale wards, which are uh, at use in the late 19th century. And so the nurses lived in these uh, cabins within the ward. So it's, it's their home uh, as well as their place of work. So again, we have this reinforcement of a household model. So the primary means through which I can analyze the careers of individual nurses, their periods of sickness, their deaths, any uh, biographical or family information about them is through pay list records. And you can see those uh, records here from 1782 on the left-hand side. So these were transcribed uh, and filed monthly to the Sick and Herp Board uh, by the Naval Hospitals. And what I did with these payless records is I transcribed them into a database, which started as Excel, and then it runs on my PHP on the back of my website currently. So my database is primarily focused on Plymouth Naval Hospital, where I've recorded all female employees, not just nurses. And it covers from July of 1777 when payless records start until December of 1799. And during this period, over 1400 women worked at Plymouth with more than 150 nurses working each month during times of high patient numbers in the 1790s. So I'm in the process of adding the Hasler payless to my database. Um, and again, all female staff, but given the size of the hospital staff at Hasler, which is approximately double that which is at Plymouth, uh, the payless records, which here is my hand uh, in the archives against um, records from 1794. And you can see just how long uh, these payless records are. So I've gone into detail here about the broader methodology of my nursing history work to show the types of records that are kept by the Royal Navy on nursing. And there's also other uh, materials such as letters, petitions, um, the journal of the governor of Plymouth Naval Hospital. But primarily for individual nurses, I rely on payless. These same records are kept uh, at quarterly and not monthly intervals for foreign hospitals, including those in the greater Caribbean. And those records will allow us to explore the labor of enslaved women as nurses in naval hospitals. So I turn now to fear of hot climates. So this depiction here by James Abram, which was also used as the uh, image uh, advertising this talk, is known as a, par a parody astrological diagram showing opposing aspects of the life of settlers in Jamaica, featuring languorous noons and the hells of yellow fever. So this image uh, really characterizes the perceived inhospitability of the tropical or torrid environment to European settlers. So Europeans could survive in the uh, Greater Caribbean, but they would always have this fear of tropical disease. And you can see that yellow fever himself uh, is depicted as being a, a cask of ale and he's holding drink in his hand as well to show the, the dangers um, aren't just disease, but also other forms of um, illness that can visit upon settlers in these environments. So the British, uh, particularly uh, the British Army and Navy had a great fear of the West Indian climate. 
So Stuart Henderson, in his medical treatise, a letter to the officers of the army under orders for, or may that hereafter be sent to the West Indies on the means of preserving health and preventing that fatal disease, the yellow fever, writes and says, those islands have been emphatically and often too justly styled the grave of the British army. But I believe at no period since their discovery has this so strongly verified as of late. And so Henderson's work um, really illustrates a growth in the 1790s of literature written by medical practitioners to try and prevent disease for European bodies in the West Indies. And this uh, depiction here is of the last stage of yellow fever where you start uh, to have black vomit and blood from uh, coming out. So it's, it's a very unpleasant uh, death. So it's something that I, I feel is very right to be feared. To give you a naval perspective, Rear Admiral Bartholomew James writes uh, in 1794, the dreadful sickness that prevailed in the West Indies is beyond the power of the tongue or the pen to describe. In a few days after I arrived at St. Pierre, I buried every man in my boat twice and nearly all a third boat's crew in fevers. And shocking and serious to relate, the master, mate, and every man and boy belonging to the acorn transport I came from England in, and had continued my pennant on board during the whole time up to the 12th of May. The constant affecting scenes of sudden death was so, was in fact dreadful to behold, and nothing was scarcely to be met but funeral possessions in this town, of both officers and soldiers, and the ships of war so extremely distressed that many of them had buried almost all their officers and seamen. So there's a very uh, visceral reaction that is happening among um, officers in the army and the Navy to what is going on in the West Indies and how to stop it. But I want to go into a bit of detail here on why it's believed that European bodies are suffering from this in a way that black bodies are not. And I wanna characterize again, this is what was believed at the time. And that was constitutional differences. So while the fear of hot climates among British soldiers and sailors was certainly affected by death and disease that I've just described, it was believed that once a European body survived a period of tropical disease through seasoning, they would be relatively safe in a torrid environment. The military and naval medical communities of the late 18th and early 19th centuries generally believed that when it came to tropical fevers, there were two groups of people, those deemed susceptible to disease and those with immunity to disease. Working on a mid 19th century American perspective, looking at New Orleans, uh, historian Catherine Ovarius has termed this immuno capital. So once you have immunity, you have a, a, the ability to accrue capital through your very body. So most British medical officers thought that black and Creole, meaning blacks who were born in the West Indies, um, that those people were at least somewhat immune to tropical fevers. I have come across no case um, in any medical professional's writing that says that they were not immune. There's always the idea that there's some immunity. In contrast, European born soldiers and sailors risked death through a lengthy seasoning process. Some military pre medical practitioners, such as regimental surgeon William Lampierre, even believed that black people could not come down with yellow fever or malaria. He extended this alleged immunity to typhus and scurvy, which are both non-tropical diseases that plagued European troops. So this belief in constitutional difference led to depictions such as John Linings, and he's talking about uh, yellow fever in Charleston, that quote, there is something very singular in the constitution of the Negroes, which renders them not liable to this fever. For though many of these were exposed as nurses to the infection, yet I have, yet I never knew one instance of this fever amongst them, though they are equally subject to the white people to the bilious fever. So these perceptions of constitutional difference and labor hierarchies, which I'll go into a bit more detail uh, when I discuss nursing in the Greater Caribbean, meant that uh, black labor was the preferred uh, source of labor for any fatigue related duties. So 
So even after a European uh, soldier or a sailor had undergone the seasoning process, they were thought to not be able to handle manual labor during the hottest periods of the day, what was, were classed as fatigue duties. And that if they participated in fatigue duties, it would lead to sickness and eventually death. So when fatigue duties were required, uh, such labor was often performed by enslaved black men. As you can see here, this is the pay list for the construction of the Jamaica Naval Hospital in 1742. And uh, because I wanted to show uh, the, the scale of the list, I'm going to read the top headings of these columns uh, so that you can see them from left to right here. And all of these are, are quotations. So the first one says time of entry. The second says owner's names. Then, um, which you can see the list of, of many more names. This is as quote, Negro's names. The quality is all listed as laborer. That's why there's just a tick. The next column is time of discharge, followed by number of days watt. The rate per day, which was the pay per day, and it's one shilling, 10 pence and two farthings. The sum due, and then the final column is to whom paid. And you can see here, uh, it just says their owners. That's all that is listed in this column. So in a similar way, you can see uh, the labor of black enslaved men in the Jamaica Naval Hospital. So this is, uh, so in this box, um, there's the four men who worked at the hospital in, from this pay list in 1806. So we have George and William of no, no last name, who are listed as surgery servants. Devonshire is listed as a barber and James as a dispensary servant. And I'm just gonna blow up the pay list here. And as you can see from this blown up version, under the heading, quote, we whose names are under mentioned do acknowledge to have received Mr. George Maud, uh, agent of the Naval Hospital, the sums expressed against our names. So essentially this is who is signing for the pay of these men. And all we have here is a notation that says, quote, received the same for them, followed by the names of two witnesses, J. Gregory and Isaac Haringa. So again, these men are not uh, receiving their pay. That pay is going to someone else. So the same justifications here that we have for uh, the labor of Black enslaved men in naval hospitals, whether they're construction or actually the day-to-day -day function of naval hospitals are used for nurses as well. So again, the concepts of immunity and the influence of climate on health. And I want to state quite explicitly here that these perceptions of immunity and the reality of immunity is a really complicated understanding. So it is true that many West African slaves were exposed to yellow fever virus in childhood and they gained lifelong immunity before their forced transport to the Greater Caribbean. But such immunity was not universal. Immunity depended on having lived in an endemic yellow fever region. The same yellow fever immunity could occur in the West Indies among the European settler, enslaved or local populations if individuals survived a first exposure. Many experience the disease as children without showing symptoms. Neither Europeans nor Africans could acquire immunity to malaria, except for those West Africans and their children who had a genetic sickle cell trait. Instead, individuals would gain what is known as differential resistance from regular exposure to the disease, which lessened and in some cases masked the illness entirely. Therefore, while African and Creole uh, enslaved people might have had immunity to yellow fever and differential resistance to malaria, this is not a certainty. Regardless of the complexities of immunity, the persistence of this culturally constructed and race-based view of immunity for Blacks and susceptibility for Europeans form the basis of selecting Black nurses for work in naval and military hospitals and larger British civilian and military understandings of this labor in the Greater Caribbean itself. 
So there's also societal expectations and labor structures in colonial spaces. On the stratified and racialized labor market that have been established in the West Indies from the 17th century, magnified the associations between naval and military nursing and domestic skills. In a tropical climate, enslaved women were viewed by both medical practitioners uh, and the wider planter class as the ideal women to perform nursing labor because of their apparent immunity to tropical diseases and their domestic labor experience. And you'll see when we discuss the duties these nurses are performing that they are primarily based in domestic skills. The final justification here was the economic benefits to both enslavers and the Navy. So following the 1807 Slave Trade Act, which was the act that banned the further importation of enslaved men, <clears throat> sorry, of enslaved men and women from West Africa into British colonies, this is a significant financial uh, penalty to enslavers who were the, the ruling planter class of these colonies. At the same time, the Navy could pay less for nursing care when such work was, pay, was uh, performed by enslaved women. And the Bermuda case study, which I'm going to explore here momentarily, really shows the financial benefits to enslavers. So I want to discuss, uh, before I move on, the, the importance of the payless records for Bermuda. They're the most complete set of any hospital payless uh, for naval hospitals in the Greater Caribbean. I do have payless from Antigua and Barbados that demonstrate pay for enslaved nursing labor. But the wages for these women are either lumped together under headings like night nurses um, or are only listed by their first names. So for me, as a historian, one of the most beneficial parts of this Bermuda hospital pay list is that not only do I have the records with individual women listed, but they are listed uh, by the last name of their enslaver. So I can pair these payless records with the Bermuda slavery registers to find out more about the women, including their age, where they were born, and their listed occupation. So the Bermudian slavery registers for 1821, that's the, the photograph on top here, list eight enslaved women as the property of John Gibson, who held ownership in trust for his son, Joseph, and his daughter, Frances Mary. So of the eight women, only the youngest, Mary, who was listed as being 12 years of age in 1821, was never employed at the Bermuda Naval Hospital on Ireland Island. These women uh, were not employed solely as nurses, but also worked as cooks, bakers, and washerwomen at the hospital at, at various times. However, all of the Gibson enslaved women uh, were in, employed at the hospital worked as nurses at some time between 1816 and 1824, which is the, the time of the Payless. And then on the bottom, I have um, a, a Payless that's from 1818, October to December. Again, these are, are quarterly rather than monthly. And you can see Diana Gibson, Sarah Gibson, uh, Hannah Gibson listed as the first three nurses there. And then you can see up top um, what they are listed as being in the slavery register. So you can match uh, their ages. And I don't know if you can see their birthplace on the side, but Charlotte was uh, born in St. Augustine, Diana was born in Africa and Hannah in uh, Bermuda. So this is a detailed pay list from 1821 and it's also one of the pay lists that has the darkest writing. Uh, so that's why I, I've chosen to feature it here, but it's a, a good illustrative case nonetheless. So in this pay list, you can see that Peter Gibson uh, listed on the 1821 slavery register as a 44 year old laborer who was born in Bermuda, worked regularly as a cook and a baker in the hospital from July of 1817. The next name on the list is Judy Whitney, who worked as a washerwoman, or sorry, washerwoman. And then Diana, Charlotte, and Sarah Gibson, as well as Lettuce Brown, who worked as nurses in the hospital. And all of these women were enslaved women. So we're gonna move across the pay list from left to right. So this is the column with the names and the quality. So the job they did in the hospital, um, as well as when they entered. The next column shows their pay uh, listed from the top 
uh, to the bottom in the order that I mentioned. And I have enlarged the, the center of this playlist here to show that um, they were vittled by their owners. That means that, that they were fed by uh, their enslavers. So when I look at European nurses and indeed all uh, British medical personnel and officers in any naval hospital, not just the ones in the Greater Caribbean, they were fed uh, and clothed at the expense of the Navy. So again, these people often lived in the hospital as well. So you get food, lodging, and, and clothing. So in this case, um, you can see uh, here from the notation that the enslaved laborers are all listed as being, quote, vittled by their owners. And then we're going to go to the last section here. So again, we're moving from left to right on the pay list. So this is the uh, notation of, of pounds, shilling, and pence, and then the signature of who received that money uh, on behalf of the agent of the hospital. So you can see that John Gibson signs as having received pay for not only Peter, Diana, Charlotte, and Sarah, but also Judy Whitney. And in then much more faded ink there down at the bottom, you can see that Harriet Brown uh, signed to receive the pay of lettuce. So the Gibson family uh, is very interesting to me because they seem to have such close ties to the Navy. And one reason I think that is because they ran a tavern. So uh, the Gibsons seem to have had closer ties than most Bermudian families to the Naval Hospital. John Gibson, this is uh, one of his advertisements here for Neptune's Hall, which featured a billiard table, suitable refreshments, uh, intended for the gentlemen of the Navy. And he placed this advertisement uh, for three issues of the Bermuda uh, Gazette. So the, the tavern, Neptune's Hall, was also conveniently located in Spanish Point, which is close to Hamilton, the, the capital, but also close to the naval dockyard on Ireland Island. So it was very easy uh, for these quote unquote gentlemen of the Navy to access. Um, this uh, establishment and perhaps also uh, form relationships with uh, John Gibson. So going back to the payless, this is the front page and you can see I, I have the, the weights that are from the archive to hold it down. Um, and the Navy, whether this was to starve off perceptions of corruption or to distance themselves from enslaved labor, at the same time that naval ships were policing the coast of West Africa to enforce the Slave Trade Act, they required the agent of the hospital who submitted the payless to swear the following attestation. I do swear, and this is a quote, I do swear that the Negro slaves in the foregoing list opposite to whose names I have put my signature are not the property of any person or persons belonging to his majesty's naval hospital establishment or in his pay or service. Neither has any such person or persons an interest directly or indirectly in them or any advantage from their being at the said hospital. And again, I find this attestation, which does appear in other payless records, but in this case, I find it particularly interesting because you can see that there is such a close relationship between the Gibsons and the Navy, uh, and especially in terms of employment, who is being uh, working at the, at the Naval Hospital. So I find this I find this really fascinating and I would love to find out more about uh, these Bermudian families once I can travel <laughs> and visit the archives again. So as I have shown above, John Gibson regularly sent enslaved women to be employed at the Naval Hospital. However, he was not the only enslaver to do so. This table lists the women employed as nurses, and sometimes they're also employed as washerwomen at the Naval Hospital, and how much money their enslavers made from their labor. So interestingly, those families who hired out enslaved laborers to work at the Naval Hospital held a comparatively small number of enslaved people in their households. The 1821 slavery registers show that Mosley Nash, who's listed here uh, as netting 
per enslaver, 28 pounds, 10 shillings, and two pence, was a house servant and George Nash's, her enslaver's only laborer. Similarly, John Sheesby hired out both his female enslaved laborers, uh, Molly and Amy. So Molly uh, was paid 23 pounds, three shillings, two pence, and Amy three pounds, 18 shil sorry, 13 shillings, and four pence uh, to, uh, to John. And they were the only uh, female enslaved laborers that were in uh, John Cheesby's household. So these small numbers and the occupational distinctions of the enslaved laborers suggest that their enslavers were urban and may not have been particularly wealthy. And even in parts of the greater Caribbean, even in other parts, sorry, of the greater Caribbean, urban enslavers would have been more likely to have labor connections with local naval hospitals due to their location in an urban area. Additionally, these types of families were likely the most in need of added income that hiring out their enslaved workers could provide as the households were not tied directly to a plantation economy. And I just wanna again highlight the, the amount of money that the Gibson family is accruing on the labor of these enslaved women. So Diana Gibson uh, makes the most at 139 pounds, one shilling, followed by Rose at 131 pounds, nine shillings, nine pence. And then Sarah, 114 uh, pounds, 12 shillings, two pence and Charlotte at 100 pounds, nine shillings, eight pence, and Hannah at 26 pounds, 13 shillings, and six pence. So again, the Gibsons, uh, as you can see by the names here, have the largest relationship with the hospital and also having the largest continued employment of enslaved women in these places. So I haven't really spoken much about what naval nurses did in, in naval hospitals, and I want to close by discussing the importance of their work and, the, and its similarities to work in naval hospitals in Britain. So one of the primary duties of naval nurses in, and enslaved women in the Greater Caribbean was cleanliness. So you can see here the top regulation, these are taken from um, the instructions for naval hospitals on foreign stations and they refer here uh, to the agent, uh, sorry, to the surgeon. So these are instructions to the surgeon. And it says that every patient who's admitted needs to be washed by the nurse uh, before they enter into the hospital. And it also says that you, meaning the surgeon, are to take care that the wards and the utensils to be constantly kept in the state of most perfect cleanliness. So cleanliness was um, a preventative medical uh, factor. So if you could maintain cleanliness of both bodies, beddings, and wards, then you could help to stop contagion. That was how, how it was viewed at the time. Um, and you could also stop miasmas from forming, so foul air uh, from forming through cleanliness and ventilation. We also have involvement in what would be perceived as general nursing care and following the surgeon's instructions. So in the top, it says that the medical officers are to instruct uh, the nurses how to take care of the patients. And the nurses are also responsible for monitoring the patient's conditions. So whether um, during the day or the night, if this patient's condition worsens, then they should immediately contact the hospital mate, which is kind of like a, a surgeon's mate that you would see on a naval ship, so a, a lower order medical officer. And again, uh, from the previous uh, instruction that nurses are to care for their patients with the greatest tend tenderness and attention. And if they are, are doing not that, <laughs> then it should be reported um, to the surgeon. You might be surprised uh, by this one, so nurses were responsible for giving medicines. So the medicines themselves were prepared by the hospital's dispensary, but then they were given to the nurses and placed uh, at the head of the cradle, which is the bed for the patient. And so the nurses were to uh, ensure that the patients took their medicine when they were supposed to. And something I'm exploring is the rate of literacy. So 
whether nurses are actually able to read the instructions that are on uh, these medicines and or if they're just simply following verbal instructions on, on what's being given. Nurses were also involved in uh, what I would call infection control. So in addition to the, the uh, preventative medicine of cleanliness, nurses were to um, ensure that patients who had contagious diseases were kept separate from those other patients uh, who didn't have contagious diseases. And if it was deemed by the surgeon at the hospital that the patient was contagious, their effects were often burnt. Uh, this included the clothes they came in with and they, so they would be given hospital dress and they would be again sectioned off from the hospital. And some institutions are actually able to have separate wards, uh, but most hospitals in the Greater Caribbean are not uh, sufficiently large to be able to perfectly section off those who are deemed contagious. And it also, this regulation discusses how the people who will be communicating with or in contact with uh, these contagious individuals are medical officers and nurses. So the nurses um, are in danger of getting that infection as well, which is why we uh, talk again about this perception of immunity so that the nurses who are being uh, working in these hospitals are perceived to be immune to the two biggest killers of Europeans in the Greater Caribbean and that's yellow fever and malaria. The final duty was the management of linen and stores. And again, this maps on very well to a household uh, management structure. So linen and stores were given by the agent. This is an instruction to the agent now, um, given by the agent to the matron. So the, the person who's in charge of the female staff and then she was to have a control over their uh, use, but it was also the nurses within each ward who were responsible for the linen and stores within their own wards. So if you compare these instructions from foreign hospitals to those of uh, hospitals Hasler and Plymouth in the British Isles, they're very similar. The only difference is that nursing appears less in the instructions uh, for hospitals on foreign stations, because there's less instructions. So if you compare uh, the size of this book to the size of those um, for Hasler and Plymouth, it's about half the size. The instructions for Hasler and Plymouth also have a detailed section for the duties of the matron. And there's a store matron and there's a, a ward matron. So there's two women who are working uh, as the monitors of the nursing and other female staff. So there's more detail there. There's no separate instructions that are issued specifically for hospitals in the Greater Caribbean. And there's also no mention of the use of enslaved labor in these instructions for either men or women. So I wanna end here by talking about the importance of nursing care for tropical fevers. So uh, having uh, set the stage of the deadliness of these fevers, it was often the case uh, that medical practitioners like William Ferguson, who I'm going to quote here, viewed fever nursing as essentially the only effective treatment once a fever took hold. And he writes, no remedy after the disease is established, none whatever in the way of physic, meaning uh, medicine. For the best physician that ever existed will lose more patients than the most ignorant hospital mate if he neglects the precautions of discipline and cleanliness. And if both, if both be on par in this respect, the event will in nine cases out of 10 be precisely the same. Hence, it appears that physic does nothing and has done nothing towards establishing a better mode of treatment since the days of Hippocrates. The battle is to be fought by the nurse. Whether in the shape of the physician or other attendant, it matters not. Only let that attendant be sagacious and diligent and the patient is saved. The contrary, and he dies. So in Ferguson's quote here is mentioning um, the, the, the care that a physician could provide at the bedside. But in reality, just given the ratio of patients uh, to hospital officers, medical officer staff, it's nurses who are doing daily bedside care. And this is the same in the Greater Caribbean as it is uh, elsewhere. So the labor of black women, whether enslaved or free, 
was central to the functioning of naval hospitals in the Greater Caribbean and has wide ranging implications for how we understand the history of nursing. First, enslaved labor of black nurses in naval hospitals adds another dimension to a familiar tale of black labor benefiting European colonial rule by situating that narrative within cultural and environmental understandings of medicine. Second, studying the experiences of black nurses in British naval hospitals forces us as historians to not only consider the work of nurses before Nightingale, but to also push beyond Nightingale's view of nursing as a white middle-class occupation. Centering the experiences of black nurses, both enslaved and free, in the Greater Caribbean reveals a deep history of racial diversity within nursing, a diversity that is too often obscured by the long shadow that has been cast by Nightingale. So I want to thank you very much for your attention.